Kuchu. Ang nung jumpa paka mato kay tumla ka na tip tisa mla ka nung padal pita ka chun tay krom may bika pikray lok nun chie na bay minok ka mato ka tang sumlo din dal chupu na chum liin som chui. Thank you, Mr. President. May the week so good look back here. So much of the soil looks right back here. We spoke about U.S. Congress report on Vietnam's ambitions toward Cambodia. We spoke about the key to the Soviet Union. We spoke about the key to the Soviet Union. We spoke about the key to the Soviet Union. We spoke about the key to the Soviet Union. We did the same with, with, with China. Uh, of course, um, who is missing in this um, lineup is King Father Siu. Um, and his views and to the uh, Vietnamese invasion mm -hmm. in, in 1979. Uh, uh, you spoke already briefly about uh, uh, King Siu. Uh, uh, you spoke about uh, your interview or his brother his press conference in Beijing. Um, would you be able to tell us some, some details about uh, the content of that five-hour uh, press conference that uh, Prince Xi gave in Beijing uh, in January 1979? Um, yes, as, <clears throat> as I talked about it with the international prosecutor, it was a long interview. He explained what it was like to be in, um, under house arrest, how um, his whole, so what he lived through during Democratic Kampuchea. Um, then he went on to New York to the UN, and that's a speech that I actually covered, where he um, threw in his lot with the with, with Democratic Kampuchea, saying that he was really worried about Vietnam. And then afterwards is when he then tried to um, to um, stay in the United States or France, and they refused. Thank you. My, my question is to his press conference in Beijing. Mm -hmm. um, would more focus um, on his views on the, the Vietnamese invasion and um, what, what his opinion was, what had led to the Vietnamese invasion, and how it should be uh, viewed in general. Um, I think you made a very good point. Of course, I don't remember exact words, but it was very clear. He's throwing in his lot with Democratic Kampuchea. He's afraid Vietnam is going to swallow up Cambodia, and he kept that line all throughout. So is it, is it your recollection that there is really, when it comes to the Vietnamese invasion and its and Vietnamese ambition, there's no light as to what he said in Beijing and what he officially said before the Security Council, uh, I believe it was 5th of January in 1979. Not that I remember, no. Um, do you remember the exact uh, uh, words of his speech? Um, maybe I could help you a little bit. Uh, he, he compared the invasion of uh, Vietnam uh, decay as um, the invasion of uh, Nazi Germany of Poland. Do you remember that? Um, and then he went on to say that um, he was going to be and that he used, um, um, he was he was using the example of um, a big boa constrictor being Vietnam slowly swallowing up uh, Kampuchea. Do you remember him saying that? 
No, I, as I said, he kept saying swallowing kampuchea, and the DK leaders all said swallowing kampuchea. So yes, that was the line. And, and did he, do you remember, qualify the Vietnamese invasion as uh, a naked act of aggression, annexation, and the fulfillment of long-term uh, ambitions to swallow up little kampuchea? Absolutely, it was standard but speech for the next couple of years, absolutely. So then would it be a fair conclusion uh, in your expert opinion that there was not much light between um, what the Soviet Union saw as Vietnamese ambitions, what China saw as Vietnamese Vietnamese ambitions to the UK, what um, The Soviet Union and China did not agree on Vietnam's ambitions. So um, Vietnam and the United States, uh, you, know, uh, you had the Soviet Union, and I, I don't think I that, that Douglas Pike is particularly a relevant issue, but um, I, would, I would definitely disagree with you that the Soviet Union and China agreed on, on what Vietnam was up to. Okay. Um, so the Soviet Union and China now let's talk a little bit, if that's okay with you, about Vietnam itself. We talked about its ambitions or its policy to uh, DK or Cambodia in general. Would you, uh, would you be able to tell us something about the regime um, post-30 April 75 uh, in unified uh, Vietnam? led by uh, Le Duan or Le Duan, as I understand you have to pronounce it in, in Khmer. Would you be able to tell us anything about um, the regime that he was uh, leading in Vietnam? That's a big subject. You mean how they were unifying it? Uh, I, I don't know where to begin. I, I agree with you. It's a very big subject. But um, <laughs> let, let, me, let me focus on, uh, for instance, its policy toward uh, the Soviet Union. Would it be fair to say that um, the one was a Stalinist and a close follower of the Brezhnev doctrine? There's no question that uh, Vietnam was very close to the Soviet Union and was very fearful of the Chinese. Um, and since Ho Chi Minh and his famous um, expression about the lips and the cup and the teeth and all that, there's no question they were Soviet side and um, very starting to question um, Chinese behavior. I briefly mentioned the Brezhnev Doctrine. Would you be able to shed some light on what the Brezhnev Doctrine is? Well, the Brezhnev Doctrine is a doctrine In what regard? Excuse me, especially in regard as to what should happen to uh, socialist countries that would not stay in ideological line with Soviet uh, Union. Think uh, of Czechoslovakia and maybe think of Afghanistan a year later, 79. I don't... I don't... Uh, I, 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 In my limited research, the Brezhnev Doctrine, what Brezhnev said was that when forces that are hesitant, excuse me, forces that are hostile to socialism try to turn to the development of some social country, turn the development of some socialist country towards capitalism, it becomes not only a problem of the country concerned, but a common problem and concern of all socialist countries. And I just want to make sure that Council has the same understanding that Brezhnev was talking about a country turning towards capitalism. Well, I'm not sure that Czechoslovakia in 1968 was turning to capitalism, but let's, let's leave that discussion aside. My, my 
Uh, my my question is, would you be able to put the impression of doctrine in the light of uh, uh, the soldiers in the age of 68 in they already put two of those piles. Uh, you put the microphone closer to me. I, I will speak louder. That's, I suppose, the only uh, solution. So again, um, would you be able? That like this? Would you be able to put the Brezhnev of doctrine? Um, or explain it, um, taking Czechoslovakia 68, Afghanistan 79, um, into the consideration and discuss the Brezhnev doctrine, and of course especially how Vietnam was related to that doctrine. Um, quite frankly, I've never seen that comparison before, can have you? You mean the Brezhnev of doctrine and, and 68 You asked me if I, and maybe I mis un misunderstood uh, your question. You said Russia's doctrine as it applied to Czechoslovakia, Afghanistan, etc. How does that affect Vietnam and Cambodia? The, th the thing is, we're going a little fast. I, I, I agree, but I have only limited time. So my, 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 what I'm trying to achieve from, from my question is, uh, would you be able to, to tell if Vietnam, uh, uh, adhere to uh, the Brezhnev Doctrine, was uh, in agreement officially with the Brezhnev Doctrine. Um, in other words, were they in agreement with the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 68, and later the Soviet invasion in, uh, in Afghanistan in 79? Generally speaking, in other terms, maybe, were they called the Cuba of, of Asia? Were they in the same um, could they be seen in the same terms of policy as Brezhnev in the Soviet Union? Um, given this, I have not seen this comparison before, but in 68, Vietnam was so involved with the war, I'm not sure that, I, that they would say one way or the other. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see the comparison. I, I cannot remember an official Vietnamese statement saying the Brezhnev Doctrine um, informed their invasion of Cambodia. I do not remember that, no. um, Are you aware of Soviet advice to, um, to Vietnam to, to, do a, to do with a DK a Czechoslovakia, same thing, to do with DK as the Soviet Union did with um, Czechoslovakia in 1968. No, I'm not. Maybe let me rephrase Some another term. Um, was Vietnam, Vietnam. Um, in 76, 77, 78, 79, uh, a Soviet satellite in the Stalinist tradition? I would never called Vietnam a Soviet satellite. No. Um, but you have read Stephen Morris' book. It will be difficult to find the exact quote, but that is basically his um, understanding of Vietnam versus the Soviet Union. Would you agree with that? Um, I agree with Nayan Chanda's analysis, which is a much more independent Vietnam, not a Soviet satellite. And I think what is pertinent in this argument is that um, Vietnam was incredibly poor after 75, very poor. Uh, the United States started an incredible embargo. And the, the poverty of, of the Vietnamese led to their people being sent to factories all over Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, to work. And it was highly resented by Vietnam. Those of us who later visited, they hated it. And in fact, if you remember when the Berlin Wall fell, you saw all these Vietnamese workers trying to get out. So they were definitely beholding. They were so poor, they had to pay back all that debt with sending their workers out. 
this was known, this was publicly known, but that I don't think meant that they were satellites, I meant that it meant that they were very poor and they had to do that. Would you agree with me that Nayan Chandra was able to use uh, Soviet archives as opposed to uh, Morris, who was able to access material I'll repeat for the, my expert on Soviet ar archives yeah, is not necessarily Stephen uh, Morris. It's the man, um, the uh, Danish man who just won the Pulitzer uh, called for Embers of War that went through him. And um, Sophie Quinn's judge, I think, is better. And um, I don't, and neither of them would ever have called um, uh, Vietnam a Soviet satellite. Vietnam, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on in like relation to Vietnam mm -hmm. and very briefly uh, on its, its own human rights record. Uh, you have written about that in your book. Um, would you be able to say something about um, mass executions in South Vietnam uh, by North Vietnamese troops after 30 April uh, 75? Especially former South Vietnam officials and military. Um, there's no question their human rights record was abysmal. I can't say that I know of um, uh, exact reports on the number of executions and so on and so forth. Um, but that maybe the fact that the government's still in power and you have no access to them. So um, I'm not alone on that one, but no one is defending Vietnam's human rights record. And just to finish that, that topic, of course, we all remember uh, the million plus uh, boat refugees, uh, ethnic Chinese who were expelled from Vietnam. Would you be able to say one or two sentences about that? Yes, and um, I actually reported on all that in both sections. Um, there are two, as you know, two different boat people, the ones in the south who made it largely to Southeast Asia and the, uh, the Chinese in the north. And that was very much related to uh, Cambodia, the ones in the north. The ethnic Chinese became very suspect by the Vietnamese because the Vietnamese thought the Chinese were behind their, um, their war with, with um, Cambodia. And they, um, even though the ethnic Chinese had been completely supportive of uh, the communists, they were driven out, a lot went to Hong Kong. And um, it was another one of the tragedies in this horrible war. Now my, 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 my last question on this topic would be in the light of uh, what we talked about earlier um, in terms of Vietnamese ambitions to a decay. Uh, the, uh, Vietnam's position in the Soviet bloc, if you will, uh, it's abysmal, your words, record, uh, human rights records. Um, now, would you be able, in your expert opinion, uh, to qualify um, the invasion of Vietnam of DK, is that, was it a large-scale act of aggression, as Prince Sinu calls it, or was it a humanitarian intervention? Did you say humanitarian? Yes, I did. <laughs> light on and off. Um, I don't think anybody's ever accused the Vietnamese of doing a humanitarian invasion. Um, this was a power on power invasion. Um, as you know, I think uh, the, the Cambodians overstretched with their small little border war. They had no idea the Vietnamese would come back as quick as they, might, uh, they had. The, um, the humanitarian was stuck on at the end when they tried to get um, the UN to support them. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, since I, um, one has to be skeptical of all governments, um, the one thing I did write is that if Thailand had invaded and overthrown Phnom Penh, there might have been a very different reaction. But there, no one has ever thought the Vietnamese invasion was humanitarian at all. Well, 
I'm not sure about, about that, but um, I would like at least uh, the record to reflect that you were laughing at my suggestion that it even could be a humanitarian intervention. And you were laughing because it is a ridiculous notion. Would that be, would that be correct? I laughed because I've never okay, heard it before. No one, there were hum, there's definitely a humanitarian component when they <coughs> defeated the Khmer Rouge and the Khmer Rouge left. But no one ever thought that this was primarily humanitarian. If there had not been a border war, Vietnam would not have invaded. It was secondary that there was a big humanitarian component that the Khmer Rouge were overthrown and the people had, had, had a breather. But no, I, I, I don't know anybody who believes that this is anything but a Vietnamese response to the border war with Cambodia. Um, you just gave a very interesting answer uh, to my question, or at least part of your answer was interesting to me, and that is the following. You said that um, Vietnam pushed the Khmer Rouge out, kicked the Khmer Rouge out, or beat the Khmer Rouge in similar terms. Um, but isn't it true that the government that was installed, all members of that government were in fact former Khmer Rouge? Uh, and to, to uh, expand on that, uh, Prince Sihanouk called the leader of that newly installed government uh, a pitiful puppet of the Vietnamese. So I'm a little bit lost when you say that the Khmer Rouge was expelled. There was just another faction of the Khmer Rouge in power as of 7 January 1979. Uh, no, I mean, that's like saying <laughs> that um, the, um, the Vichy government was just another branch of the French government. Um, Hun Sen, Hang Simran, they were a front for the Vietnamese. Everybody wrote that. It was clear. They were not, they were, they were not part of democratic Kampuchi anymore. They weren't. They had fled during the Eastern Purges. And then they were the front for the Vietnamese. In fact, when the Vietnamese argued, when the, when Sihanouk was arguing at the UN, they pretended they weren't there, and we all wrote they were. So to say this is an extension of DK, they're former DK, yes, but they were completely split off from DK and they were fighting DK. Um, that brings me to my, my, my next topic, uh, um, When, which year do you put um, the uprising, as you will, or the split within the Khmer Rouge, um, and the split into two groups, or even three groups, um, one led by uh, Pot, Munchi, Ing Sari, and the other one led by Sao Pim, Runim, uh, and, and others. When, which year, which time you put that split? Your Honor, the question presumes all kinds of facts that the witness has not testified to. The question presumes, obviously, counsel would like to uh, presume this, that there was a conspiracy between various members Ross Nim, South Pim, etc. If counsel wishes to ask the witness whether that was the case, that's fine. But you shouldn't ask for a question presuming facts that there is no evidence from this witness about. Uh, I will, I'll be happy to uh, move that a little bit. Um, would you be able to tell us something about um, the rebellion or the split within the Khmer Rouge before the Vietnamese came? Um, Sao Pim, Runim, they were mentioned earlier. Um, one committed suicide in 78 June, the other one was executed. Would you be able to say something more in general terms about that? As I describe it in my book, it's, a it's not a split, and it comes from the top, and it is, um, as the evidence shows in tool slang, it is uh, 
an attack on the various regions for the center to take more power. I don't describe it as a split. I describe it as a approach. Um, of course, this will be a topic in this <laughs> trial, whether that is an actual action uh, 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 if, if I use your words, your words, and, and call it purge, uh, a purge implies that the other side thinks that the other side is betraying. Now, when do you think um, the betrayal for which purge, purges were apparently necessary started? When did um, Pim, Sao Pim, and Runim um, start opposing DK's policy? Can your honor, there has been absolutely no evidence from this witness that Ross Nim or Sao Pim oppose the policy, but I think I'd let the witness answer the question. Exactly. Uh, um, The evidence shows that the center began purging the regions in 1977. So that would mean exactly when do you think they thought purging was necessary? The records show that they, um, oh boy, um, it's in such detail, I don't even want, know where to begin, but um, it, it, it just became a snowball, and um, they started to see, um, they, you see it switch in, um, in the confessions where they see the enemy no longer necessarily as CIA or KGB, but they now see it as Vietnam. And um, that's when I, that's sort of 77, and that's the way I would date it. Um, there is no, um, unless you have it, I don't remember major policy divisions that were cited. It was um, a, a, um, a general sense of traitor betrayal, but it was one side had all the power and did all the killing, and the other side was in the, in the region. The center had the power, did the purging, and they went systematically through the different um, regions. Um, I would like to, uh, to show which is the follow-up of, of a documentary film which was um, used as evidence uh, very often in the first trial. Uh, it's a book called Behind the, the Killing Fields from uh, Sam, Ted Sambat and Gina Chong. Uh, is it correct that you said earlier that you know this book or do you know only the film? Only, only the film. Uh, Mr. President, with your leave, um, I would like to uh, quote from this book. Um, I don't see as quickly the E3 number. E15 2.2. And the ERN number in English that I'm quoting, it's page 106 of the book, and 007, 5752, um, Khmer 00, 858, 348, um, and 42. Um, just to give you a little background, um, that some bad is quoting um, what seems to be a no way they got good. Uh, mid ranking uh, cadre from the uh, Northwest. Got, zone. Got, 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 um, um, he is uh, called in the book no, uh, Chan Zahuk. Uh, he, he used to be the head of the hospital in the region Batambang. Uh, uh, um, he is uh, quoted or paraphrased by Tetsambat as follows. Got, got, not strong, uh, 
Chan Subut, head of the hospital in his region in Batambang, said in an interview in one of the meetings he attended in Sudan, Runim said secret secrecy was mandatory because anyone who was found to be part of the plot would surely be killed. The plan is very big and important. If you want, things will be good again, Safud said. We were encouraged because some some members from Kuantan, like Kuantan, supported this plot, and we had to stop him in the East. This particular statement of this mid-ranking cadre from Batambang seems to be supported by another cadre cited by Tetsambat in his book. And I read in the book that would be ERN English 0071 Khmer 0085839 and 40. It's page 104 in the book. So five in Khmer Rouge cadre said there was indeed a plot to overthrow Khmer Rouge and the rest of the leadership. In would be led by northwest and eastern zones. Everyone knew about the plot to overthrow Popol's leaders. Putting this to 76, would that change your answer you just given in the light of the testimony of these two countries? Um, it's, I know Sambat, I know when he did these interviews, I, um, I, I would take it with a grain of salt. I do not think that is proof that there was a plot, but uh, would you be able to ex expand why you would take that with a grain of salt? Two isolated interviews, I'd want to find some follow-up. That's um, it's way after the fact. There's no other supporting documents. Uh, I'm just quoting uh, uh, two. Uh, um, there's, another, there's a third one, by the way, but I'm just uh, quoting two from his book. I'm not sure if he uh, doesn't have more. As a matter of fact, there is uh, evidence in, in the file, which I'm, I'm careful in my phrasing, uh, Mr. President, seems to corroborate um, um, uh, this evidence uh, indicating that uh, the Southwest Zone, the leaders of the Southwest Zone, and the leaders of the Northwest Zone were uh, conspiring already uh, in 75-76. How did they do that? They had big storage of rice, uh, uh, weapons, etc. in order to be able to, uh, as, they, as this card says, overthrow uh, the detail. Again, my reaction as to uh, what your opinion or your, your reaction to be rather. Um, I would like to ask you to ask you to ask you Your Honor, that misstates the evidence in the case file. I know exactly what counsel is referring to. Uh, we've made a submission to the court, and that grossly misstates the facts. Uh, it's not for counsel to ask, I think, the witness to evaluate evidence that will be determined I'd be happy to, to give direct yeah, quotes, but then we go into an area where I, I'm sure there's like a million objections and I don't, I don't uh, want to go there. So my, my, my question in general would be, uh, Mrs. Becker, again, why would you say that we have to take the findings of Ted Sambat, which you laid down in his book, but also to a certain extent in his uh, film with a grain of salt? Because that's the line of the DK leadership, and that's what all these people were forced to confess. It is exactly what you did to us in our archives. This is not new. This is, um, you spend time in the tool slang archives, and every single one of them was accused. You know, that's, 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 
correct in not saying something yeah. which is new. However, yeah, there, the there are people who apparently, as I understand the book correctly, were not into Islam and say this uh, voluntarily. Uh, so, I mean, I can see your point when you yeah, say you have to be careful with interpreting confessions of S21. But although there are many arguments to be made about that, but they, these seem to be cadres which uh, have not been in, uh, in S21 and are apparently uh, speaking freely uh, to Ted Samban. I'll repeat. This was the Excuse me, there's no question. Um, it hasn't been a question. It seems that the expert uh, or the witness was understanding my question. Uh, was already starting to address my question. Uh, Mr. President, if I could address you. There's a procedure in like courts that, that I've been, been in, in the last, last 35 years uh, where questions are asked and answers, answers are given. given. Uh, if without a question, there's no opportunity to object, without a clear question, the direction of the examination becomes less fruitful and undirected. So I would ask that the counsel ask the witness questions and not simply make statements and then wait for a reaction. Mr. President, as you are fully aware now, this is a very important topic to the new GEA defense. Trying to establish uh, how rival factions uh, were fighting each other in DK. Uh, I think we should have some leeway in this. Uh, uh, the, the expert is perfectly able to uh, grasp firmly, to use a DK term, uh, what I'm putting uh, before her. Uh, and if she can, then she can. Uh, 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 she can. Uh, uh, she can. Uh, ទោះបីអ្នកជំនាញមានលទ្ធភាពនិងសមត្ថភាពពេញលេងក៏ដោយក៏នីតិ <coughs> I'll, I'll do it differently, Mrs. Becker. Uh, it looks like allow me to put it to say you that some uh, sort of rebellion led by Rune himself in already started in 1975 Is that correct or correct am I wrong? Wrong? I do not see the evidence for that, so I think it's wrong. And, um, uh, the, I continue to say that these were purges from the top to the um, I'll move to a, um, another topic, Ms. Becker, and that is the, um, the murder of uh, Malcolm Caldwell. This is more an issue that you can testify to as, uh, as what you have seen and, and experienced. Uh, and I would like to take you to um, the same document that I used, uh, that I referenced to use to give you quotes from Richard Dutman. Uh, he's also in that uh, same report that I gave you quotes about, uh, giving his views on, on that night, on, on what happened. And let me take you, Ms. Becker, to, it is for the record, E3-3290, ERN-004-19211. Um, I quote as follows. The third Westerner in the party, Malcolm Caldwell, 47, an economist who specialized in Southeast Asia did not make it through this ordeal. He was shot to death. The three of us were targets of a terrorist attack, an apparent effort to embarrass the government. Of um, 
my question to you is, first of all, your reaction as to this very short analysis of Dublin on the tragic events that night. Um, I don't understand what you're asking. I'll, um, I'll, I'll expand. Um, you, in your book, have given a possible theory as to the why of the killing of Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, because of time, I quickly went uh, to quote from Richard Dutman in his own report, and he seems to suggest that uh, the killing was done in an effort to embarrass the government of Putin. Uh, and if I understand your analysis correctly, correctly uh, you seem to suggest, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it was something that was done uh, within DK or even possibly by uh, uh, DK officials. My question is, uh, uh, should be able to shed some more light on uh, the why of this killing? Um, first of all, I think it's important to understand Dick doesn't suggest foreigners, does he? Uh, no, he doesn't suggest Vietnamese. No, 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 he seems to suggest in a, that it was uh, probably done by locals, but in an apparent effort to embarrass the government of Cambodia. In other words, to embarrass the government of Rather that it was done at, uh, the instigation of Pol Pot, which maybe, I don't know, if I'm wrong, uh, it's a Pol Pot record No, I didn't suggest that at all. Um, um, it's what, what, I, I, what I suggested uh, was that, um, first of all, in tool slang, it's clearly Cambodian v. No, Cambodian. And if you're going, and I also say it's so irrational that to try to find a rationality for this is the same as finding rationality for the millions of Cambodians who died during the Khmer Rouge. However, if you push me against the wall and said, what would be a reason? The most obvious reason that came to my mind was that there were some people in DK who were not happy that Ying Suri had promoted opening up the country to foreigners who were not friendly delegations. That's the most obvious thing that I can think of. But I don't pretend that I know. Would it be possible that it was in fact uh, the people that were behind this attack and this murder uh, were local? Uh, Khmer Rouge cadres, but acting on instructions of the Vietnamese. If I were the Vietnamese and I had those cadres who infiltrated the pen, I would not go after them. There are far better targets to go after. That's why it doesn't make sense. It's why us. Why are the Vietnamese and the Vietnamese and the Vietnamese uh, it's, it's, it's speculation, but um, in your expert opinion, would it be the possibility that, in fact, it was an act done by uh, members of the opposing factions at instructions of Vietnam? Um, I think I've answered that question. That's a huge stretch. Very well. Um, I would like to go to another topic, that's the, um, the use of propaganda by, uh, by Vietnam, to talk about the use of propaganda by DK extensively, uh, but now I would like to, to, to go to um, a passage in the report of Dr. Spike to U.S. Congress. It's, uh, Mr. President, it's E3-2370, I'm going to English on page 00187389, and French 00344740. Let's note that uh, Dr. Spike is going to talk about the use of propaganda by Vietnam uh, following the cutting off of the diplomatic relations between DK 
ហើយគេសម្ដាប់ទូសាទាំងមូលប្រព្រឹត្តអំពើសាហាវ sort of sum up this, the use of this, these examples, uh, Douglas Pike writes in his again as follows. Uh, both sides make, make bits for world public opinion. The Vietnamese the Vietnamese the Exaggerating the human rights abuses, abuses that there were undoubtedly happened, the but they were exaggerating by giving these uh, outrageous examples. I, I interpreted his, um, his report as, uh, uh, like that. Would you be able to give a reaction on, on his report? Oh, as a journalist, I, I can't disagree with you more. The Vietnamese have always been more skillful in terms of propaganda and getting it across. During the war, uh, the Vietnamese communists were welcoming to journalists, invited them in. The DK killed all of us who went onto their side. DK was very unfriendly to foreigners. Um, look at how they closed themselves off. They were clumsy and incompetent when it came to getting their message across to foreigners. And what he's talking about is that the Vietnamese understand how to reach out to reporters, how to reach out to foreigners, bring them in, show them this. They were bringing in people all the time. And it was that skill that he was talking about more than anything else, I would say. What did you read from DK? They didn't let you in. I think we actually agree with the president. The quote is, both sides make bids for the public opinion. The Vietnamese are far more skillful than the Cambodians. So he seems to suggest that uh, both sides of the propaganda campaign, only the Vietnamese were much more skillful in the propaganda campaign. Yeah, we're talking about propaganda. We're not talking about content. We're talking about the skill of propaganda. And I would say the Vietnamese are more skillful. I'm not talking about the content on either side. Thank you. 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 Propaganda is per definition in, 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 in these terms about uh, the content. He uh, seems to suggest uh, that uh, that is correct, but I would like to have your opinion. He seems to suggest that uh, Vietnam uh, did a very skillful job in, in, in exaggerating or portraying very gruesome stories about what happened in the UK. Would you agree with that one or not at all? Would you agree with that one or not at all? Would you agree with that one or not at all? No, I don't think that's what he's saying. Uh, the, 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 the grizzly stories about the DK were coming from refugee camps. And, um, refugees were telling their stories. And, um, I don't think there is equivalent. I don't know that he's saying there is equivalency. I'm saying one is more, I can hear him say one is more skillful than the other, but I don't hear him saying there's equivalency, no. Um, you, you mentioned in your answer uh, the stories of refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's all right with you, I would like to go back to uh, uh, the eyes of the pineapple, the book of Burglar. Uh, and in the, uh, the first pages, he's trying to analyze um, uh, how the refugee stories should be interpreted. Um, also in, in, in the light of what Vickery has written about that. And I'd like to uh, give you a quote from his, his book. Um, it's the second page. I thought I had an uh, ERN number, but I'm afraid I don't have it right now, but I will give that later to you, Mr. President. 
he writes as follows. He's actually talking first about uh, uh, an example of a long list of distortions and manifest uh, dishonesty by serious and supposedly responsible uh, non-partisan uh, Western journals. And he goes on to quote to say, and I quote, distortions also occur through the bias in refugee reports, the major uh, source of information. These reports emanated mainly from upper and middle class urban people who had lost all or most of their wealth and who, therefore, had enough reason to hate and discredit the new regime. With the sorry conditions of life in the refugee camps, they would depict the situation in democratic Kampuchea even worse than it was to justify their flight. This bias was compounded by the frustration and tensions of refugee life, by covert pressure from camp leaders, Thai officials and foreign agencies on whom the refugees were dependent. Um, by homesickness and the refugees' accounts with each time, they would also tell the stories they thought the interviewers wanted to hear, supposing this might help them get out of the camps to some third country. They were, all, they were well aware that their interviewers were more interested in sensationalist horror stories. Hearsay became personal experience. Uh, and camp leaders, subordinate to anti-communist Thai officials, did select refugees to recount atrocity stories, stories Sometimes standard interviews were handed out written by people who could neither read nor write, and sometimes they not even speak the Some refugees gave different stories End of quote. Um, well, Madam, Mrs. Becker, you just testified earlier that you haven't Looks actually like spoken to uh, uh, refugees yourself, but are you aware that, that, that there is a the discussion in academic literature, Vickery, Berkler, but to a certain extent confirmed uh, by a witness on the stand, Francois Ponchot, uh, that um, there was a lot of exaggeration uh, in the stories of refugees in uh, I didn't say I. <laughs> Merci, Monsieur le Président. Pour, pour nous bah, permettre de suivre les questions, est-ce que le concept va nous donner un petit peu de contexte Il nous parle des, des travaux de Vickery, nous l'avons fait à l'école, il nous parle des témoignages de Poncho. Dans un précédent procès, nous l'avons fait à l'école, nous l'avons suivi. Il faut que vous récupérez le concept de vous expliquer un petit peu plus les éléments qui lui permettent de formuler les questions à Madame Lexmer. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie. Uh, in, in any case, I have the ERN number, I have the ERN number, it's 0102125, it's document E307-5.2.17, forget about Poncho, forget about Vickery, um, my, my question is, Ms. Becker, your reaction to the quote from Burglar, as to the reliability in general of refugee stories. First of all, you misquoted me. I only said in that particular instance I had not gone to Thailand to talk to refugees. I did before I went to Democratic Kampuchea, and I also talked, interviewed refugees when they got to the United States. So I did not say I went to Thailand. Of course, you always treat refugee stories with care and caution, and you do all kinds of due diligence. That's not in debate. And as I wrote in my book, there were many instances where you had to be careful and look at it. For instance, when they said anybody wearing a pair of glasses was killed. That's, that's, a, that's an example. You question them. And you find pretty soon they, it's 
becomes it's not just it's not wearing glasses it's someone who's considered an intellectual <coughs> and then pretty soon you find out where, but you have to be careful there's no question that is I don't think that's that issue at all that does, to be careful doesn't mean that you think they're liars so I disagree I do not think the refugees were liars I think most of us did use care and caution and I think my profession is better than you just described it well, my, my, the point of my uh, reading, reading the, the quote to you wasn't saying that the refugees are liars, uh, but that you have to be very careful with uh, um, assessing the value, the value the value of 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 the value stories of refugees in the light of the question as to uh, the propaganda, the use of propaganda by uh, Vietnam uh, and then by its public government of atrocities, mass atrocities. So my question is, uh, in, in relation to those two things, on one hand, uh, exaggeration of atrocities, and on the other hand, uh, being careful with um, interpreting stories of refugees. My question is, would you agree that in order, in order to be able to assess whether there is a deliberate effort uh, of exaggerating the mass atrocities, uh, the stories of refugees are not relevant in order to I got lost in what you just said. Now, you mentioned the, the, uh, who's, who's, who's using refuge? I have no idea what you just said. We started, my, I started my questions with a um, citation from Pike and the use of propaganda by uh, Vietnam. We were talking about whether Vietnam was more skillful. And then he said uh, that's very true. You have to look at the content. The content is actually true. And in order to uh, back up your answer, you were referring to uh, refugee stories. And then I sort of countered you, yes, you have to realize refugees are not always telling the truth. So I suppose I come back uh, to my original question. Did Vietnam and its uh, installed government um, 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 use propaganda uh, means to exaggerate uh, stories uh, of atrocities uh, uh, in detail? I'm going to walk you through what I think just happened. You quoted a October 1978 Douglas Pike. I said, by 1978, there were any number of refugee stories on the Thai border. Then you just said that this has to do with the installed government of Vietnam in 1979. Uh, Vietnam the propaganda top 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 it's, it's a very dizzying thing you just did, but when journalists were finally all allowed to come into Cambodia under the Vietnamese occupation and they opened the doors, they didn't have to say a boo word. It was, it was the first time it was opened up. So propaganda as making things up, no, I'm not going to agree with you on that one. I mean, tool slang was there. The records were there. That's what's being used in this trial. Mean, uh, not had slang behind. Talking to slang is something different than uh, to slang to walk walk the day. story about killing people because they had glasses, uh, uh, killing uh, people because uh, for whatever reason, something case different of than to slang. And by then, the question, if this was a question, the by then, then we had, no, we no, had no. Refugees, and uh, my book begins with May Kampot, who describes how they were killed in the cooperatives. He's someone I know and trust, 
and has nothing to do with tools mine, but he was finally free to talk because 1979 to uh, an answer to a question that you uh, gave um, from the prosecution, that is about killing of a child. Uh, uh, you read a few passages from your book. Uh, you recall recall them. Them. Uh, but I would like to, rec to read to you one other passage uh, in your book as well. It's page 253 of your book. Um, and that would be document E3 slash 20. Here ends English 0023 it's the first paragraph of your book, page 253, and you uh, wrote there as follows, and I quote, one of the greatest concentrations of charms was in the eastern zone. Sophim, leader of that zone, had a reputation for disciplining his car and preventing unnecessary bloodshed, but he showed no mercy towards the charms. Just as the Eastern Zone has complied with the party's orders to suppress the communists returning to the war, so the Eastern Zone complied with the program against the charms. Uh, is it your opinion that the killings of the charms were mainly done by the Eastern Zone troops under the leadership of Sophie? Let, let disregard the killing, the actual fact, uh, deed of killing, was that done uh, in your opinion, primarily by Eastern Zone troops? Yes, I am going to look at the other side It's just as I've written it. Yes. Yes, I'm going to go បាទសម្រាប់ការថ្ងៃនេះដល់ត្រូវជប់សម្រាប់ហើយអង្គជម្រះកាសអគិចតម្រើកាសម្រាប់ការតម្រាប់ថ្ងៃនេះត្រឹ